So, um, as Chris said, I'm Brian Genright. I am a senior software, software engineer at a place called Metametrics. And before I get started, um, by a show of hands, who is familiar with the serverless concept or serverless model? By a show of hands. Two. Oh, man. All right. Okay. So, um, but who's, who's familiar with Whiskey apps? Yes. Whiskey. It's a web service gateway interface. Who's familiar with Django? Or Flask? Or anything? Okay, you're familiar with Whiskey. <laughs> All right. Um, and who's familiar with uh, AWS? Anybody else in here use AWS? Okay, cool. So uh, this talk shouldn't be too foreign for you. Um, and I'll, I'll s sort of jump in. Uh, so uh, the serverless concept is one where you would use um, uh, new services called function as a, as a service. So in the past, we've had platforms as a service, database as a service. Um, and now, uh, a couple years ago, AWS introduced a service called Lambda. Uh, and Lambda is just that, a function as a service. You write some, some code, a function, whether it's in Python, Node.js, or Java, and now C Sharp uh, as of last week. And you can get back, it, it will run on AWS's infrastructure, infrastructure. You won't have to spin up a server. Uh, you don't have to do any updates, OS or package updates. Um, you just give it a zip file, or you can even write code in their management console, and it will do the computation on their servers, and you will, will be billed by the millisecond. Uh, so there's no no more wasting servers, wasting server time. So you don't have to build. You don't have to build a, a EC2 instance to run cron jobs or uh, set up queuing or, or all that stuff. Um, you can run cron jobs really with with Lambda. But that's not really what I'm here to talk about. Talk about today. I'm, I'm here to talk about deploying a Whiskey app, a full Whiskey Django Flask. Uh, app on AWS Lambda using API Gateway and using also using CloudFront and RDS, which is their database as a service platform. So without further ado, we'll get started. So a little bit about me. I've been writing Python since 2007. I've been working with AWS since 2007. Like I said earlier, I work at Metametrics in an attempt to build cool tools for like kids and educators and publishers and whatnot. Um, I am a Zapper contributor, um, uh, but I am no by no means the best person to talk to. Um, I am a I have been a core contributor since well since it started almost, um, but. I encourage you, if you like what I have to say here today, please join the Zappa Slack community um, and just use that URL right, um, right here and you'll be able to get into our community and if you have any questions, I guarantee you somebody will answer them. Somebody will spend at least an hour of their day going through and trying to help you. Uh, and uh, also read the docs um, for the Zappa project. Uh, I'm not brave. There will not be a, any live coding or live deployments. Psych, I'm lying. Of course we're gonna do a, a, a deployment, but I'm not gonna do any real live uh, coding. Uh, and if you want more details on what I, I, I talk about tonight, um, I go into more detail on a blog post that I wrote uh, about, about this subject. So, let's jump in. Uh, so, first we're gonna talk about the AWS steps, the things that you need to uh, 
do on, in your AWS account to, so this strategy will work. Uh, next, we'll go through some steps on, on how to change your code in your local environment and setting up environment variables. Uh, next, we'll go through some Zappa commands that you'll need to run. And then last but not least, we'll go through the optional steps of setting up a CloudFront uh, distribution to make this strategy even faster. Or so let's go. So the AWS steps, these steps are like AWS focus, and I'm only adding them so you know what, what we're doing, um, what's going on. But I highly encourage you, and if you check my blog, check back to my blog in the next couple of weeks, there should be a, a CloudFront template that you can use, and it will automate most of these steps here. Um, uh, and also check out, uh, you can't see it because the, the table is here, but check out Troposphere. If, you, if you're into AWS and you um, write CloudFormation templates by hand or through some other mechanism, uh, Troposphere is awesome. So step one um, is probably the simplest step. Uh, just create two S3 buckets. Um, you're going to create one bucket that the Zapper library will upload your code to briefly while it's deploying it to uh, Lambda. And then the, the second bucket is, uh, especially if you're, if you're running a Django app that has static data or something static files like CSS, images, JavaScript, uh, you need somewhere, you need a place for those files to, to stay. Uh, while you can upload files and, and to a Lambda function, uh, it's not going to serve binary files for you. Uh, and, and if it did, it would be, wouldn't be as fast as just serving it through S3 and CloudFront. So you should definitely serve all of your static media from, from S3. All right. uh, configure your VPS, I mean VPC. Uh, maybe your app doesn't need a VPC, but I'm a strong believer that if your app has, um, is using RDS, which is like My, MySQL, Postgres, MariaDB, Aurora, you should probably use VPC. Um, reason being, um, while your HTTP app, your, your web app may be resilient to DOS attacks, uh, database servers are, are not built for that. They're not really built to withstand them. So keeping your stuff behind a VPC is the best way to keep people from taking you down. <laughs> So if you're if you're if you're definitely if you're in a production environment and you and you have to use um, RDS or um, Redis with Elastic Cache, uh, use VPC. It's, it's, it's worth the, it's worth the time and investment. Uh, so going going on with this um, configure your VPC steps, I'm going to go through some of the. I'm going to give a brief overview of, of what you should do to configure a VPC. Um, so create uh, at least two public and private subnets in a different availability zone. And so availability zones, if you're not familiar with them, um, Amazon has regions, which are like US West or US East, um, but they also have availability zones, which are entire, entirely different data centers within a certain region. Uh, and it keeps your, your app uh, up, really. It, it gives it more uh, availability. Uh, create a NAT gateway. Um, the NAT gateway will, it will allow your Lambda functions uh, in a private subnet to, to just connect to the internet. Um, this, this stuff is important, really, if you use things like MailChimp or Twilio or, or any other outside uh, API. Um, other than like S3. Uh, all 
and create a route table. Um, a route table, it'll just, basically what it says, it'll just route the internet uh, through those subnets uh, correctly and out through the gateway. And create a VPC endpoint for S3. This part is important uh, mainly for this uh, command right here. Um, if you're familiar with Django, uh, as some of you are, there is a collect static um, uh, command that we're going to run later. So it, it's really important for that. And create a custom IAM policy. Um, please do this because the, the one that we give, the one that comes by default with Zappa is way too loose if you're doing um, corporate or, or production work. Um, so, and that's it. Uh, so the next step would be to create your MySQL instances or, or your Postgres or whatever database instance that you need through RDS and create a Redis cluster or I guess you could create a memcached um, cluster as well uh, through Elastic Hash. Um, make sure to set those up with the, with the subnets from your VPC that we set up earlier in the earlier steps. And then that's it for AWS. You still here? Everybody still, still awake? All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then, so next we just go into like the code and, and local environment steps. Um, these are the steps that will require you to change your code, um, especially if you're going to use, especially if you're going to develop in a local environment, um, but mainly because we're, we're going to use um, environment variables. By show of hands, people that do web app work, just, just for my curiosity, how many people in here use environment variables in their settings files? That's more than I thought. That is awesome. That's awesome. Um, if you're going to if you're going to do this, I would I would highly recommend that you use environment variables. You don't have to. You could hard code them into your settings files and put them in a Git or a Mercurial repo. Um, but having the the key benefit for doing it, one of the key benefits for doing um, a deployment this type of way is it's very easy to set up staging and, de and, de and development environments on the internet. Um, and being able to change database settings, Redis settings, um, all kinds of settings on the fly with just a JSON file uh, is very, allows you to move a lot faster. Um, it can you can you can really make a lot more deployments per day, <laughs> and and keep your keys and passwords outside of GitHub, where they're probably not safe. Uh, next, uh, install a virtual virtual env, uh, and then install virtual env wrapper. And this is probably the part that's probably new on this slide. Mostly everybody here probably uses virtual env or has heard of virtual env and virtual env wrapper before. Um, but Eva is something that I wrote and it allows you, um, and you don't have to use this, but I, I, th I threw it in here because it's, it makes things a lot easier. It, it allows you to set up a .env file that will, if you do development locally um, without using Docker or uh, Vagrant, uh, it allows you to populate environment variables in a virtual virtual environment very easily. So if you have that .m file, uh, as soon as you type work on in the, in the virtual environment that you want to work on, it will automatically populate the, the, your environment variables from that .m file. Uh, so it makes development a lot easier um, doing it locally with something like run server or or G Unicorn. Um, and here are, are like the bare minimum things that you probably want to get used to get started. Obviously, if you're using Postgres, you don't need to use 
you don't need to install uh, MySQL or Python. But you will need something like Zappa. And uh, you don't need Ems. That's another project that I wrote to allow you to easily pull in environment variables. Uh, and then uh, you, you'll definitely need Django storages if, you, if you're working with Django and Django Redis and Bodo. And this is more, more Django specific stuff, but um, I figured the easiest way to talk about this is to go down a specific path. So it was either Flask or Django, and I chose Django. So, <laughs> so create, create a project. That if, if you use Django, this, is, this isn't anything new. And then uh, here, oh, I, can't, I can't zoom in. Either way. Uh, you probably won't be able to see it, but here I'm using the, the M, M library and I'm just populating, I'm going through the settings file and then populating, uh, I'm, just, I'm just taking out all the default variables and then repopulating it with environment variables, a way to pull in the environment variables. And I'll, ha I'll have these, um, these, just, uh, these GitHub just on, on my blog, on the blog post that I uh, gave the URL for earlier. Uh, another thing that you'll want to do is have a custom storage uh, backend. Uh, I stole, I pretty much stole this one from Cactus's blog. Um, Dan, it, uh, Dan's post on it, I've referred many people to, it is very good. Um, I see you shaking your head. You've, 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 you've used this before as well. It is, it is if, if you're doing Django work or if you're doing, even if you're doing class work, uh, the concept, the concepts that he has in that blog post about how to store um, images on, on S3 and how, how it should work within a WSGI app is, is pretty on, on point. So I encourage you all, uh, I'll put the link here to the, to the blog post. I encourage you all to, to check it out. All right, so now we're down to the, like the, the fun stuff. Um, the few commands that you need uh, to run locally or, or put into your uh, continuous integration server to deploy WSGI apps on the internet. All right, let's go. So uh, you need to run the first Zappa command that you need to run is, is called Zappa init. And it just creates like a configuration file. Um, and I'll, I'll show you. Ah, I wish I could. It's, it's just a JSON file. And you load uh, settings about your uh, environment variables, where, what uh, bucket to look at to pull a JSON file down that has your environment variables in it. Uh, and also, it tells, it tells the, the Zappa where to look for your Let's Encrypt key. So who's, by show of hands, I know I'm doing a lot of this, but by show of hands, who has used Let's Encrypt to get free SSL certs? Three people. Why are you guys paying for SSL certs? Okay. <laughs> well, that's the cool thing about this. So it will, it will um, create a, an SSL cert automatically. And so you don't have to go back in three months. It automatically renews it using uh, Lambda. So it is, pretty, it is pretty slick and you can get free SSL certs instead of paying like $9.99 or I know some people pay like $100 for like SSL certs. So, Do yeah. you mind just bump that other laptop? It's kind of got this hypnotizing screensaver going. Excuse me. Oh. <laughs> close that or I don't know. Closing? Okay. Um, will I do it or? Yes. Good. Thank you. Uh, and then you, you'd also uh, input your VPC settings here. Uh, the the private and these would be the private subnets, not the public ones. 
major, you'll get different results if you put the public ones. <laughs> uh, and, and the security group ID. Uh, so here's where the magic happens. You run Zappa Deploy Dev, and within two minutes, you have a website. Um, fully auto-scalable <laughs> website. Uh, uh, you only run this command once, and then after the first time, because this command sets up the API gateway, uh, you, you run the update command. So instead of running Zappo deploy dev, and dev is the, dev would be the uh, environment, one of the environment names that you set up here. Uh, it will just update. It will just update with the new code uh, if you run the update command. And so now you're, you're probably wondering, like, well, I have management commands I generally run on the, on a deployment, like migrate or other things. Like, <laughs> uh, well, there's a Zappa manage command, and you can run. It will run your management command on the Lambda servers. So it'll just run, a, it'll just run your function, but pass in the, the, run the management command. Uh, and, uh, as I was talking earlier about Let's Encrypt, once you run this certify, it will send out a request to the Let's, to the Let's Encrypt uh, servers, and in about 40 minutes, you'll be able to go to your domain, and it will have an SSL cert. Um, uh, but if we go back to the deploy, the deploy will give you, since we set up the, the a domain in this, in this uh, settings, JSON, the deploy will give you two URLs. So it'll give you the default API gateway uh, URL, and then it will give you the, the domain that you specified here in the uh, JSON file. Um, and so the next one is, is just another management command. You can run collect static here. And I have to tell you, if you've ever run um, Django storages, and then run Python manage collect static, it can take like 15 minutes or depending on your connection. This will run, I guarantee you it will run within 15 seconds because it's running on EC2 really close to S3 and it's, it's gonna run, run really fast. It, it will run almost as fast as if you do it locally. Uh, And then here's where, here's a part of my talk where my idea and my strategy differs from most people. Um, by, by show of hand, how many people have ever used CloudFront as a CDN? No. How many people know what a CDN is? All right, yes, okay, uh -uh, now, now I got something to work with. Okay, so how many people only use CDN as something to deliver your static files faster or your videos faster. How many people know that a lot of big, a lot of, most big companies use CDNs to deliver their whole site? Yeah. So think of, some, in, in some way, you could think of, of CloudFront as a hybrid between like a, a generic CDN and then something like a varnish cache. Um, and you, you can serve your whole site through, through CloudFront and it can take you from being able to do 200 requests per second to being able to do 25,000 requests per second. All of which you get from day one while your site still costs you nothing to run. 
Oh, that was the, that was the other big part of part about using Zappa and going serverless. If you set up a new web app and nobody comes, then you don't pay anything. Like you have like almost three million seconds a month for free, and they charge by the millisecond. So you can, you know, that digital ocean box that you have for five dollars a month or ten dollars a month or the EC2 instance that you have for like anywhere from 20 to 30 bucks a month you could just turn that off and still get the same amount of scalability probably get probably getting better scalability um, I'm probably not going to get any hand show of hands on this one but Anybody ever heard of a site called Bustle.com? B-U-S-T-L-E. It's like hustle, but spelled with B. It's mostly it's mostly a a site for twenty-something females to learn about news. But they do they have like a um, hundred million, like like fifty million <coughs> users and like a hundred million events a day. <coughs> and this is this is pretty much the exact same strategy they use. Uh, and so it allows you to, to really be cost effective, but really fast at the same time, and really scalable at the same time. Um, so without further ado, um, I wanted to show how I set up my CloudFront, uh, how I set up my CloudFront distributions to, to make this work. Um, I use two, two distros, I mean two origins, and so one here is my static content, which is coming from S3, and then the second one is my API gateway, or it, it's, it's my Lambda app application, it's my Django application, or, or whatever you want to call it. And then next, I have multiple multiple patterns, right? So all of the static patterns up here, if we look into it, I set very, very high, I set very, very high TTLs. So this stuff will be cached at the, at, at the, the cloud front edge for an hour. And so it, it, won't, it won't come back to, to, to S3 for an hour to get an update. So if, if if I'm in Belgium, the person in Belgium will, will be able to download the, those files just as fast as the person here in Raleigh, or the person in, in Virginia where the servers are. Well, not, maybe not just as fast, but really fast. Faster than, <laughs> a lot faster uh, than if it wasn't. And then also, for things that I know are going to change or I need to change instantly, like, like the admin, I put zero second TTLs on. So as soon as, soon as that updates and I, and I pass all, all of my, my query strings, I pass all the cookies, I pass all the headers that I need, and as soon, as soon as that page updates, CloudFront is going back to get, a, to get a new version from the origin. But for things like, but think, but, and this is a blog, this is, this is a, a distribution for uh, my blog. But for things like the homepage, where I think yeah, I want it to be cached, but I don't want I don't want the cache to be that that long. I'll set up a, a 300 second TTL. So every five minutes, if there's a new bl a blog post on the on the front of the site, it'll show that blog post. It'll show the updated content. But if not, it never makes another round trip back to the server, to the origin server. So that saves me on data. It's it that keeps a lot of weight off my database servers, my caching servers, and my API gateway Lambda servers. And then for everything else, for like a blog post, 
uh, for, for all the blog post URLs, I just, uh, I, I think I just do an hour on blog posts. And it, it, if, if we run, is anybody here familiar with, with load testing or GOAD? Kind of, right? So say we ran, um, uh, th there's this load testing library that runs on Lambda called GOAD, G-O-A-D. And say we ran GOAD on my blog with um, the URL for for just the Lambda, just the API Gateway uh, Lambda one, which would be like, um, I'll do the dev one, apigw.genrate.net, I think. Uh, if we just did that one, Okay, it's, it's getting like, it's able to do like, well, you can't see it here, but US East is where it's able to do, it's able to, to do the most requests per second. Now, granted, I'm not connecting with a lot of clients, but this is the area, this is the region where I'm able to do a lot of requests per seconds at. But if you look at, uh, Asian Pacific Northeast, I was only averaging 11 requests per second. And then I think in, in US West, uh, 17 per second. And you know, that makes sense, right? But now let's try this. Let's try this on, on the dev version of the site that has um, uh, CloudFront in front of it. See how the numbers jumped? There are no timeouts, there's no errors. I could keep going. I could keep putting in more clients, and it'll get it'll it'll just keep going and going and going and going and going and going. So that's why that's why I use the CloudFront strategy because I can get a lot more with a lot with not much work. <laughs> uh, so that's that's mainly my talk. Um, if you have any questions. Uh, this is the part of the speech. Going back to the, uh, let's the, the, uh, the 3,600 value for uh, your blog posts. Did I understand that somebody that they were remote in South Korea just say they don't see a new post for an hour? Am I understanding that correctly? A new blog post for an hour? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 I could. Um, Built into the latency of the site. Yeah, there, well. Does it get pushed or does it have to no, actually, they wouldn't see it for every five minutes. So the front, remember I said the, the, the home page would be five minutes, mm -hmm. but the, the blog post itself wouldn't, be, would, wouldn't change for an hour. So if the blog post change, if like, say I post, I post, I make a post right now, right? And so every five minutes, it'll, it'll be on the, a change will be on the, on the home page. Once that change is on the home page, then you can go to the blog post and see the blog post, but any change I make to that blog post, since I set the TTL so high on, on the blog post views, won't be seen for an hour. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Seth, I have uh, a lot of commands that are uh, specific to <coughs> Django management. Mm -hmm. Does it have another separate set of commands for Flask? Uh, yeah, a lot of... Uh, uh, there's not a separate command for Flask. There is a Zappa invoke command. 
And so what, what you'll be able to tell it then is just by dot notation, it's like what package and what module and what function that you want, want run. And so you could run, just like you run Zappa manage this, you can run Zappa invoke this. And uh, it'll, it'll run it on, on uh, AWS. So that makes it adaptable to a lot of different um, and the, the 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 key reason that we, if your if your organization is like ours, um, we spend an obscene amount of money at AWS, and by our calculations, we're going to save tens of thousands of dollars by moving a lot of our apps to, to AWS. I mean to Lambda, and we're not the only ones doing it. Like at reInvent. Is this still a trial? It's a relatively new uh, service. So is it just in trial and it's free for, for now? Or and they're going to start charging for it, you think? Or? Uh, no. Is that about three years old? I remember yeah. coming out and he's scratching my head not knowing what the heck it was. No, it's two, two and a half years old. Okay. It's two and a half years old. It was been in public, public general, you know, it's been in general availability for two years. Um, and no, the, uh, AWS has this free tier for like all of its projects, all of its services pretty much. Um, like uh, EC2, you have, you can get like a free server for like the first year. Um, DynamoDB, which is their NoSQL database, you get an obscene amount of, uh, you can store an obscene amount of data in DynamoDB for free. Um, same with, you know, just a lot of their services have a free tier and the free tier for uh, Lambda is like, like 3 million seconds or something like that. So since they build by the seconds, it's, it's a lot. Um, so if you're fairly lightweight, internal apps, if you're a big global web, website, you're going like to... Yeah, yeah. If, if you're a big global, like, I think... Um, like if you're like a Bustle or a um, Coca-Cola uses it a lot, Netflix uses it a lot. Um, if you're a company like that, then you're gonna pay. Um, you're gonna you're gonna pay. You know, yeah, yeah, you're gonna go over it. Yeah, but that's your, that's your business model. yeah, but if you're, if you're a a smaller site that that only has like maybe a million views a month or um, mm -hmm. like ten million views per month, this can this can really benefit your bottom line. Uh, so I can think of a Lambda entry as a job. And that job can be called dynamically or you can schedule it to run. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the cool thing about Lambda is you have so many event sources um, or, or ways that it can be triggered. So you can have, um, I uploaded an image to, to S3. Well, that can that can fire for an event and trigger trigger a lambda. So, like, say I upload an image and I want I want a lambda to be triggered to crop it and and then upload another image back to S3. Um, I can have what's what is like a CloudWatch ev event, which can be turned into a a cron job, or um, I can have an if anybody's familiar with SNS, it's like their simple notification service. I can have a simple notification service that um, will send a will send, a, send an event, and even now you can have like RDS. Um, you can have database like a new role in your database is is made, and so that that can send off a a lambda function to be fired, uh, or um, your Echo, yeah, your Amazon Echo, which is like a big big deal now. Um, Echo skills, all echo, all echo skills. Like when you say Alexa, do this, it's firing off a, it's firing off a lambda, for the most part. Um, uh, and yeah. Uh, so I was gonna. So when I saw you deploying your dev environment, if I understood it correctly, you actually running your dev in lambda. Like if you were like instead of lo local local host, you're like actually using. Lambda to serve the site, like as you're testing it, like. No, no. Actually, I, I test locally, and that, that was a big reason why I, those Eva and and M's projects were important, 
because now um, I only have one settings file. Like, there's a lot of people that have like, okay, I got like a local settings file, and I have like the base settings file, and then we import the local settings file into it. So you're, you're like simulating a dev environment to operate. Like, okay, I got you. Yeah, yeah. Is it like I'm assuming it can't like store anything inside lam lambda, right? It's just like spitting out output, right? Uh, so what I mean, like yeah. state, I guess, can't be. Stored. Yeah. So, uh, so do you have to, to, like certain things that might work aren't going to work as a Lambda function, right? Or Before last week, you couldn't store state with Lambda. Okay. But as of last week, um, they created a thing called Lambda step functions. And it's a way to like hold state between different, um, between different Lambda functions. Okay. Uh, but that was a good question. Though. That's a great question. Uh, so, yeah, that, that, that's pretty much my talk in a, in a nutshell. Um, try it out. Um, it, it's very easy to get, get up and running. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so thanks, thanks everybody.